Okay, thanks very much for joining us. Um, my name's Matt McDonald, and this is another Research in Focus seminar brought to you by the School of Political Science and International Studies here at the University of Queensland. Today I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, Professor Tim Dunn, who is a Professor of International Relations here in the School of Political Science and International Studies, as well as being Research Director of the Asia Pacific Centre for the Responsibility to Protect, and Dr. Jean Louis Durand, who is also a colleague of mine and is an award winning uh, teacher and lecturer in international relations, also here uh, in the school. And today we're speaking about this text, the second edition of Foreign Policy Theories, Actors, uh, Cases, and uh, it was edited by Steve Smith, Amanda Hadfield, and uh, appropriately enough, uh, Tim Dunn. So I'm going to interview both Tim and Jean-Louis, in part because Tim uh, is, of course, one of the editors and is also a contributor to the book, and Jean-Louis because he uses the uh, text in his teaching, so we thought it was an opportunity to talk about how some of the research going on in the school is actually employed in practical terms, in terms of some of the um, uh, teaching that we actually do. Tim, you've researched for a number of years on foreign policy. Could you tell us a little bit about the intersection of this volume with your research interests? And is that where the impetus for the book itself came from? Uh, thanks, Matt. Uh, let me sort of uh, answer that by saying that, in a sense, primarily I'm an IR theorist, but it seems to me that, as an IR theorist, I'm very interested in empirical uh, issues, empirical crises that, that help to us to really translate some of our theoretical ideas into some real world and hopefully some policy-relevant kinds of um, arguments. So I've always thought foreign policy is a fantastically good outlet. It's, a, if you like, a friend of, of, of theory, and, and that's what's interested me. Um, and a second argument, which I'll just briefly touch upon, is that for many, many years, foreign policy was thought to be a different sub-discipline to international, international relations or international studies. And I think that part of what we're trying to do with this book is very much bring foreign policy back into, if you like, mainstream international studies, rather than seeing it as a sort of separate discipline with different kind of tools. So one of the, for example, just to illustrate that, part of this book is about setting up, in a sense, theoretical frames for foreign policy analysis, which are very much convergent with the main theoretical frames for, uh, for international relations per se. So, for example, there is extremely good chapters on realism, liberalism, constructivism, and in this particular volume, volume which is the second edition, there's also a very nice chapter on post-structuralist methodologies in foreign policy. So, so in a sense it's trying to both bridge really from foreign policy to IR, but it's also trying to, in a sense, enable students and enable, I suppose, readers of the book to think through how some of the quite abstract but important ideas associated with international relations theory in particular, how they actually play out in particular instances in particular parts of the world. That's interesting because the yeah the analysis of foreign policy has always had that that reputation of being somewhere in between public policy with an international dimension and international relations and mm. to the extent that there was in the in the sort of fifties sixties seventies this field of foreign policy analysis um, it's always had a somewhat odd position mm. in the discipline hasn't it that that it's tended to sort of descend at points into a kind of behavioural psychology, mm -hmm. it's been fairly US centric in ways Absolutely. that it hasn't really tied into uh, mm -hmm. the foreign policy experiences of, of other states. Did that, so that influenced the way you put the uh, text itself together? Yeah, no, I, think, I think so. I mean, one of the, Steve Smith, who's one of the editors, has been working on foreign policy for many decades, and I remember, in fact, he taught me as an undergraduate, and he's a brilliant teacher, and I think that's part of my interest in, in foreign policy. But there were two crises associated with foreign policy, I think, going back to the 50s and 60s. One was the behavioural revolution, which kind of implied that you can simply build up empirical data about several countries, and somehow you get an understanding of global politics. That's really where Jim Rosenhaus' comparative foreign policy mm. tried to go, and it, it ended up in... As, as Rosenhaus himself admits, and it's great actually that Jim Rosenhaus has written a foreword to this book because he's such a big figure in this area, but he openly admitted by the end of the 1970s that the Comparative Foreign Policy Project, as a cumulative way of building a, a, an understanding of the world, was really not going anywhere. That was the first crisis, and I think the second crisis for foreign policy analysis was Waltz's theory of international politics, because Waltz was such a revolutionary thinker in, in global politics, paradoxically, that if you're a strict Waltzian, of course there is no foreign policy to be done, <laughs> because the international system tells states how to behave. Now, I think in the post-Waltzian world, we've all realised that domestic politics and this black boxing of the state, which 
neorealists and structural, stru other structural thinkers tend to do, is no longer adequate. And even if we do believe that structures matter, and I certainly do, and I know my two colleagues that believe that structures matter, we still have to show how it is that those structural norms or, or power relations actually impact upon the choices made inside states. And, and who is ma actually making those choices to... The idea that a state is a state is a state is something that really good foreign policy people have tried to challenge for many decades, not, not least Graham Allison, who's also in the book. Uh, and he has, of course, his uh, fantastically good book called Essence of Decision, which is all about saying a, uh, you, know, you can't treat a state as though it's a rational, unitary actor. So foreign policy has some ways of actually opening up, I think, the, the interesting tussles that go on inside um, capitals and inside ministries and, in, and between individuals about what are the best choices to make under certain circumstances. It is uh, it is striking, isn't it, that one of the the, the key texts in uh, post almost post World War Two era on international relations treats the state in in that way as sort of functionally similar units. That's and right. Yet, uh, you know, intuitively, we all know as anyone who has any interest in state behaviour knows mm -hmm. that it's difficult to understand mm -hmm. why states behave the way they do if not for the role of history, of culture, mm -hmm. of identity, of perceptions of each other Absolutely. and the threats that they pose, who their friends are, who their enemies are, the role of domestic politics, those types Cognitive of things. Cognitive factors being Don't mention, yeah. Absolutely. Um, there's some wonderful illustrations of, of that throughout the course of the book. And I know you had some uh, additional material, some excellent uh, additional chapters in I don't this book. Oh, yeah, Lena Hansen, you're right. Oh, yeah, brilliant yes, chapter. No, there's, there's, a, there's also that chap MacDonald, written a very, very good chapter. <laughs> yes, yes, have that's a particular honest, look out for that. <laughs> Australia and, and climate change, and it's really actually great that we've got a case study from this particular book. So, there is some additional material in, mm. the, um, in this particular volume. Can you take us through why that sure. was the uh, case? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think that we. We should, probably should have been more ambitious in the first edition and actually had a post-structural kind of chapter because we've got those various large IR kind of theories but we've left out post-structuralism in part because post-structuralism hasn't really engaged in particular mm. with foreign policy analysis. But there's no reason, and this is why we wanted to do it, and Lane has done a great job, Lane Hansen from the University of Copenhagen, who's very interested in post-structural methodologies. She's written, I think, a very, very good book that shows the importance of language and some of the, some of the issues that... Uh, that you're interested in, Matt, in terms of Bourdieu's thinking and so on, are represented in her in her chapter. So that was a really important edition, and uh, we changed uh, one of the one of the, the authors in the first edition. Jeff Checkel decided he didn't want to do the chapter on constructivism. But Trina Flockhart, who's also interested in psychological issues, she's presented a very nice version of constructivism for this particular edition. And then there are a couple of interesting new uh, case studies, of which Matt's is one on on Australia. But I I think the case studies sort of section is a really important part of the book. Actually, it'd be interesting to hear from Jean Louis, who's much closer to the teaching side of this than, than I am at the moment, and it'd be interesting to see how he thinks the students engage with case material because we actually try to present the cases in a specific kind of a way, which is not to not to give the argument to the reader in the first paragraph. Mm -hmm. There's a real danger, I think, with academic writing is that we we are very clear what the story is and we're told to be very clear what the story is but we don't leave anything we don't leave any of those decisions undecided and we don't leave any of those crises not already resolved and so on and I think what was really nice about the case study section is it it shows that it asks the reader to put yourself in the shoes of a decision maker and too often political scientists and we shouldn't but too often we kind of think that the outcomes were straightforward but you know especially the wrong outcomes right the Blair you know I have, have a chapter here about British foreign policy in 2003 well we all know Blair made a historic error of monumental proportions but that doesn't mean to say that if you put yourself in Blair's shoes, there were not good reasons and fairly rational reasons for doing what he did. And I think what we want to do is we want to reveal all of that for the reader and get them to, th to work a little bit and think, well, you know, yes, he got it wrong, but why did he get it wrong? And what were the costs of not acting in the way that he did act? Because non-decisions have costs too, and it's really... It, that's something that I think foreign policy teaches you, that, sim that it's not simply a matter of critiquing a choice that was taken. You've got to consider and balance the choice that wasn't taken. And those are never mor morality-free and they're never cost-free in political terms. Mm, I think uh, certainly my, I'm increasingly becoming convinced that the, that act of for compelling students to actually think about the world from a a different perspective at all, and b from the position of a policymaker who has to weigh up a range mm -hmm. of different uh, um, pressures and objectives is is one of the uh, key challenges of actually teaching, mm -hmm. and one of the, the most beneficial things we can we can do as educators. Which kind of leads me very nicely over to Jean Louis, who's uh, as I said, an award winning um, the recipient of a major university teaching award, and has a has a reputation for a highly enthusiastic and and kind of 
interactive uh, teaching style. Does that really suit the study of foreign policy, Jean Louis? It has a reputation for being a fairly dry area of study. Well, thank you, Matt, thanks, Matt, for the opportunity to answer to this. <laughs> to this appalling charge regarding the nature of foreign policy. <laughs> foreign policy is one of the most exciting fields, the way I see it, right? Because uh, it, and, and it, foreign policy taught via case study, right, mm. is an invitation for students to, as both of you have already hinted, right, to, in, to appreciate the view, the multiplicity of meanings that are out there regarding one particular situation, right? And, the way I approach teaching, right, I approach teaching with the particular vocation of encouraging students to discover the, plur the plurality of reality. Right? And uh, for example, I'm talking, uh, we could talk for example about the, um, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Right? Right. We invite the students to embrace the American view, and the American view, as you know, is you know, all over the place, right? Because mm -hmm. if half of the members of the, uh, of the council there had been in charge, we would, we would, mm -hmm. you know, the world would not be what it is right now, right? right. But, but then I also encourage them to think, you know, to, 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 to go to, to the Politburo and to embrace the, the, the Soviet view, right? And then, so uh, in the process, um, students must state, you know, 70 words or 80 words, a policy recommendation, right? And once they think they have it pat, sometimes I force them to switch, right? Mm. So that they are forced to, to consider at least two different perspectives, right? Thus appreciating, you know, the, 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 the plurality of reality, for one thing, but appreciating the, the validity of different thinking, mm. right? The rationality, the plurality of rationality, if you want. Mm. And uh, um, you know that makes them appreciate appreciate difference in the long term, right? It, it makes them to learn to. And in this, in you see, I teach my students as if they were going to be pro uh, professional in foreign policy. Okay? Mm. That's otherwise there is no point of, of teaching them. Right? Mm. They will all be advisors to uh, um, Ban Ki Moon or to the foreign minister, right? So uh, I prepare them for this and and. And uh, I use the various case study, right, for for them not only to to know and appreciate uh, um, the nature of the, of the case themselves, but to learn how to deal with really complex situation because uh, uh, case uh, foreign policy is a deeply complex. Uh, uh, element of, of politics. That's why I don't agree that it is dry. It is so complex that it is it really is an exciting field, you know. And gradually students learn to um, you know to to deal with those complex issues right? and to uh, and to deal in an effective way by narrowing the complexity and uh, they can do that once they understand, once they are able to understand, right, to uh, the position of the other. Mm. Right? Then, then the, the, the complexity is reduced. The complexity will, will abide as long as you, uh, as the actor, the, the advisor, or the foreign, foreign minister, right, deal with uh, the reality as, you know, as from his or her perspective. Right? And this, this is very troubling because, you know, they, they, uh, it, can, it can lead to incomprehension or miscomprehension, right? And the perpetuation of conflict, but uh, and in a, in a way, this is what uh, the Bush administration, for example, has discovered when they presume so much about you know what will happen when once they go to Iraq, right? Following which there was a massive crash course on let you know to to, to, to the military and and the, the administration. Let's learn the way Iraqis may be thinking. So. This is really the way I teach foreign policy, right? by uh, 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 inviting students to have an open mind and, and to include in their reasoning the multiplicity of perspective. Beautiful. Um, I think we can get a sense of the... Uh, certainly I'm now excited about foreign policy more than I was before <laughs> Jean-Louis started Especially talking. Especially this edition. Man. Oh, this edition is, uh, yeah, streets ahead, obviously. Of the, uh, <laughs> but can, can I say something about sure. this, this edition? Uh, 
uh, your, the chapter that you wrote on Tony Blair, mm. uh, it's fantastic. <laughs> why, why is it so fantastic? Because as the year go, mm. right, as the year pass, right, there seemed to be a certain distance from the event of 2003. Right, right. Right. 2003 was when uh, yeah. uh, the invasion of, of, Ir of Iraq took place, right? And, and uh, 2003 was also, 2002 and 2003 were, were deeply emotional mm. in, 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 in Blair's life because right. he had to make the choice whether to uh, join the question, of, the question of the willing and send troops. Uh, yeah. And now, that's 10 years ago. Mm. That's ten, just about 10 years ago. And students, when I when I use first the, 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 this particular chapter, right? Students had a view. Oh yes, the, Tony Blair was you know wrong, or you know. But with distance, there is a, a, maybe a deeper re reflection. Mm -hmm. It is possible that uh, the closer the event, the deeper the emotion, the emotionality of it all, right? And and so the more the, the, the more distant the event, the the more possible, or the less detached, maybe, or the, the more detached, maybe uh, the students are able to consider the case. And last time I, I used this, this particular case, right, the class was really deeply divided, right, mm. in spite of the fact that they are all considered both positions. So, uh, deeply divided, maybe on a 50 50 basis, which really surprised me, really surprised me. Uh, half of the class thought Blair, Blair was right, half of the class thought Blair was wrong, right. Uh, and uh, I don't know, there was no third of third half of the class, <laughs> right? but, but, you know, and I was, more, you know, I reflected afterwards, how come, how can I, because when I first taught it, you know, the whole class was, you know, Blair is a crook, you know, he misled the British people or the, English, the, the British, right, the UK people. And so why this move, you know, why, you know, you know, there was one common case, right? And the study one common case, regardless of my input, or regardless of uh, you know the way the case is, uh, uh, or the the unfolding of the case take place, right? The ans you know the answers are affected by the time. The, by time. Mm. Yeah. Well, I know a lot of the a lot of the chapters in the book deal with very contemporary foreign policy mm. case studies, mm. but there's also quite a few really classic cases in there that, that speak to some of the core dilemmas and issues around foreign policy out there. The Cuban Missile Crisis, like Tiananmen Chairman. Square, yep. um, the EU enlargement process, you've got Middle East politics York, in there. The you, yeah, absolutely. So is that was that a deliberate choice to mix up the combination of... And is the idea that, that these lessons are... that there are timeless lessons from the experiences of... Well, I think, I think we chose, we wanted to choose some sort of variety in terms of where the crises took place and kind of what was it about, in a sense. Was it a use of force or was it about, uh, was it a trade issue, was it a human rights violation? So we wanted to kind of, and I, and I still think there are large, you know, there, we don't say enough, anywhere near enough in the book about Africa and so on. And uh, So there are large areas that, and there are, of course, limits to how much you can really do, but I would like us to expand even more the empirical kind of and geopolitical reach of the book uh, in the third edition, which uh, you may or may not be part of. <laughs> um, but, but your point about, it's really interesting actually, your point about the passage of time, because when you go back to revise your own chapter, which as you say at the time felt mm -hmm. like the crisis was very fresh, Blair was still a major figure in British politics, you know, it wasn't some, that, that a new government hadn't come into power, and now it's, you're right, it all feels very, very historical. But there's a couple of dimensions to that chapter that I think are really interest me and I'm sure that they interest kind of students. And I think the first one for me is that if you remember back to 9-11, Blair was the first, first global figure who really understood what America was thinking mm -hmm. and what America was likely to do next. So, so there was a very famous moment when uh, in 2001 when Blair went to his October party conference and he made this very, very forward-thinking speech about this, this is a chance to remake world order. And how many mm -hmm. times have we heard that in global mm -hmm. history? But Blair makes this amazing speech that has this peroration about the pieces of the global order in flux. When they fall to the ground, let us remake the world around us. Right? I mean, this is Britain here. This is a mm -hmm. relatively small or, or aspiring kind of trying to cling on to great power status. But Britain, Britain has no capacity to remake the world around us. But that was the stature to some extent, of this kind of Churchillian kind of figure. And then, between September 2001 to September 2003, suddenly the reputation of this world leader is in complete tatters. Mm -hmm. You know, he's been, you know, if you Google Tony Blair war crimes, you get 
million mm. of responses. I mean, this guy you know, is hated around that. He's loved in Kurdistan and he's loved in Sierra Leone. There are some places that treat him as an emancipatory kind of hero, and that's not insignificant in all of this. It shows you the deeply divided nature mm. of some of these interventions. But this was a pretty heroic major figure whose reputation and everything collapsed. Now, the question is, had he... Had he did what France did, right, and, and, and stood back and said, we want, a, we want a multipolar polar order, we're fed up with this, you, you know, these neocons and so on. Now, would he, have, you know, would he have preserved his reputation? He probably would have domestically, but I don't know whether his reputation would have been preserved internationally. So this is a classic case mm. where what was happening, what the neocons were pushing for in that unipolar moment, gave Britain no good choices, mm. essentially, and gave Blair no good choices. Now, I still think he made the wrong choice out of two bad possibilities, no, but, no, but no. he didn't have a good option yeah, there yeah, in yeah. order to maintain his status and maintain yeah, yeah, his yeah, reputation. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and it's so frequently the story of foreign policy yeah. too, isn't yeah. it? Mm -hmm. The fact that you are faced with no yeah. choices right. that will perfectly yeah. resolve yeah. the situations in which you find yourself. Yeah. One final question for Jean-Louis. Jean-Louis, how do you, in terms of actually using the book, the students you find, uh, you structure your course in part, maps on to some of the cases from the book and you find that students respond to that? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because I was thinking about, you know, the link between uh, the, the course, you know, foreign policy of the great powers and the book. Because first I designed, okay, I'm limited in terms of the great powers, who are they, right? Uh, well, uh, so traditionally I think, I mean, the, tra the traditional approach to great powerness, right? And then I fit, I choose case studies, you know, I studied China, I studied the Tiananmen Square, right, mm -hmm. and, and, and so on. Now, I study France, and it's a bit uh, vague, so I, I throw in Rwanda there, or I throw mm -hmm. in... Uh, what I throw... Uh, so, one, students love this book. Mm -hmm. Students love this book. There's no doubt about that. They, you know, at the end of the semester, right, I ask, you know, what do you think of the course of, uh, you know, da, 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 and, and the book comes out, you know, so, so it's a good reference. The book, of course, does not uh, meet all of my needs. So uh, I mentioned Wanda for France. Uh, this, this year, I designed an hypothetical right, regarding intervening in Syria, right? And there was a debate between the French and the German foreign minister, right? And, and so I had constructed the, the, uh, the hypothetical. Students had, you know, lots of reference material. And then they had to learn to view the, the world again from those two different perspectives, right? And the uh, two contradictory advice that were that, that followed. So, in other words, the, bo the book I'm using it for, let's say, 75% of my lectures, mm -hmm. right? And for the other 25%, or maybe 30%, it's either hypothetical or something that just happened. Mm -hmm. Osama Bin Laden is killed uh, on the Saturday. The following Monday, we have a, uh, an hypothetical mm -hmm. or, or a case on Os right. Osama Bin Laden's mm -hmm. death, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and, and in a way, in a way, you know, that's what foreign policy is all about, you know, crisis upon crisis, you know, that's why it's so exciting, you know. Yeah, so good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You've made your case. I think uh, an idea as well for the third edition, and hopefully if I say that uh, this is uh, now available in good bookstores and uh, with Christmas just around the corner, an ideal <laughs> gift for that special someone, then I'll also find my way into the third edition as well. But can you, uh, I, I would like to thank Tim and uh, Jean-Louis for joining me again for another research and focus discussion and we'll see you again next time. Thanks, Matt.